Okay, this is where I work. This is World Trade Center. My window. That's the Statue of Liberty. Something somebody hit uh, the World Trade Center. Yeah. You know, there was almost no doubt that that it, you know it was intentional. And it was just this sound, this rumble. People were just going crazy at that point, evacuating. My heart goes to the people who are, who are still in the building when it came down. On September 11, 2001, I was home on Wilkinson Avenue in Jersey City, New Jersey, holding my four-month-old and staring out the window at what I would soon learn to be the biggest act of terrorism that I've ever seen. It was a day that would change the United States forever. But from that tragedy came stories of strength, resilience, and self-sacrifice. One of the more unique stories from that day is that of the 9-11 surfer, who somehow managed to survive the collapse of the North Tower. I'm here today to meet him in person and talk about this miracle and how it has since shaped his life. As I evolved from a rapper to a podcaster, I've interviewed hundreds of interesting artists, tastemakers, and figures within the music industry. The more knowledge I gained, the more I was eager to learn. My interests have grown far beyond the music industry these days, and there are endless amounts of unique people in the world with extraordinary stories to tell and knowledge that only they can share. This is Humans. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Welcome, welcome. Come in. Appreciate you. Welcome to my home. Actually, let's go to the dining room. I think we'll be in here. Beautiful home. I guess you asked for moments, so... Yeah, I want to see moments. My whole life is like, you know, I mean, there's... Hey, this is you and your wife. Yeah, different highlights and... Good looking guy. Thanks, boys, anyway. Look at you. Look at you both. (laughs) I was pregnant there. Big time. Oh, I see it. I yeah, see it in a, the black. There's a wedding celebration there. It was a pretty good wedding there. Got a the little sombrero and cigar going. Oh, you're having a blast. Yeah. Let's start with your year leading up to 9-11. What was going on in Pasquale's life? Crazy, hectic, uh, beautiful, a blur. It was. We were married, uh, you know, in 98. This was like three years later. In the middle of all that, my, you know, we were able to get, you know, pregnant. Well, I was pregnant with our first child. And uh, it was just getting ready for that and gearing up and Lamas classes and construction in between and, and life. Life was just busy, but it was, it was, it was nice. Okay, and where are you working? So right now I work for, and currently work still for the Port Authority of uh, New York, New Jersey. And, 19, and that's where you worked? That's where I worked on, on in, in 1998, uh, in 2001, and I started there in 1992. I'm a structural engineer by trade. Um, what is a structural engineer? A structural engineer? Uh, we design anything that, that's based on, on structures. Um, that includes uh, bridges, uh, skeletal frames, foundations, anything that involves support uh, and structure. You know? So a normal day at work, was like what? So back then, a normal day would be, uh, you know, get up, leave from here, go to the train station, take the train down to Hoboken, take the path over to New York, World Trade Center. I would get into work. You know, normal time back then, it was like that, you know, eight to four. And when they get into work, it would just be, uh, you know, cubicles, from the World Trade Center floor, and a whole bunch of engineers. and Which floor? Pro- um, so at that time, I worked on the 64th floor. 64th yeah, floor. Because Port Authority had a lot of their, their offices in, in 
in the World Trade Center. Before 9-11, have you ever had a life or, life or death experience? I was also in the 93 bombing. That's just when the bomb went off. I was on the 43rd floor, we went down the stairs. Wait, you worked in the same place in 93? Yep, so I was standing online with a friend of mine, getting a lunch in the cafeteria, and all of a sudden I just, then I saw um, like a flash outside the window and the building kind of, you know, you felt a little bit of a, almost like a little bump or lift. Police say that it may in fact have been a bomb, a massive bomb that caused an explosion just after noon today. The alarms went off and, and everybody evacuated the building and then we, st we started making our way down the stairs. The staircases, the way the building was designed, actually acted like chimney stacks. So when that explosion occurred and the smoke came up, there wasn't any other way for it to go but through the staircases. So when you were going down the staircases, you, it was kind of getting hard to breathe. Uh, when, I, when I walked out of there, I had, it was just soot all over my face. Um, and all, all you could see is just, you know, there's like rings around my eyes, you know, and, and my mouth just clear. Everything else was just, you know, uh, covered in soot. So you go through this experience in 93. Mm -hmm. Your wife is not there to make you quit the job yet. And you go back to work. Yeah. With no second thought of that day. My wife would always say, I, I, I don't want you working in that building. Why are you working in that building? I said, I said I go, Luis, what, what are the chances I'm going to be in two terrorist attacks? What are the odds? Right. Think about it. And um, she was right on that. You know, pre 9 11, he, he was always very worked with his hands, um, always building something, you know, always fixing things. Um, I mean, this whole place that we live in was our project after we got married. And, uh, you know, every room was redone to what we thought would make a beautiful... Family home. Yeah, place, yeah, yep. So, um, you know, pre-9-11, uh, that was our focus. You know, Pasquale was always, he always had, had a plan, you know. Um, Post-9-11, throughout the year that followed was a different person. And this was actually probably two weeks before 9-11. One of these probably would have been the last picture of me had I not survived. When you woke <clears throat> up that morning, what did you think your stresses were? Losing in fantasy football because I was watching Monday Night Football. You were playing fantasy in 01? Yeah. Do you remember yeah. who played that Monday night? It was Broncos and Giants. I think the Giants lost. The Giants retreating to a red eye back to New York as they start the season 0-1. I'm looking at the points. I'm like, did I win? Did I lose? You know, I got my briefcase. I'm, you know, I get in the car. I drive to the train station. I was a little late from watching Monday Night Football, so I'm a little tired, right? So I'm getting it to work a little bit later now. I kind of missed the train, get the next one, go down Mystic Express. Okay, so you go to work. Yeah. I go to work, get in there, come up the uh, the big escalators and, and path, get into the lobby there, granite lobby, one world trade. And get everything get is it. functioning. Normally. Everything's functional, it's all great. I got into the elevator and I hit 64, which is the floor. I went up to 61 as an express from, from 44. Uh, and then it was 61, 62, 3, and then so I hit 64. All of a sudden, the elevator just shook violently. The lights flickered a few seconds. Uh, it stopped. Yeah, we were like, what the hell just happened? Oh, shit. It's 8.52 here in New York. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. It kind of, I guess, reset, um, and then it came back down to 44. So the elevator went down. Great. Elevator door opens there's complete mayhem people screaming you see you know you can't even tell which way they're running it was smoke on the floor uh heavy smoke you can even see to the across the lobby to the second set to the uh, other elevators it was hard to see and people were just like screaming running all over the place because I, I believe some of the elevators actually the cables got severed they they dropped um, they, you know, exploded when they hit. So different things were happening. We backed up into the elevator 
Again, instinctively, I just wanted to get up off the floor. So I hit 64 and I'm just praying that the, the thing doesn't stop. What about that moment would make, make, make you want to go back up? You're a structural support guy. Yeah, but I didn't know what happened at the time. All I knew was that the building was still there and I didn't know what I was going to walk into with people, you know, with the heavy smoke and people screaming. I thought something happened on that floor. Isolated yeah. to that floor. Right. So I figured if I can get away from that situation, like you're not going to walk into, at least me, I wouldn't just walk into something that I'm not aware of what I'm walking into unless I see like an, an opening. So I didn't even know where to go, right? In hindsight, of course, you know, everything, you know, everything's 2020 hindsight, right? You go back, you're like, shit, I should have just walked through there and, and found the uh, staircase and, and just left. Well, tough to say you did anything wrong. Yeah. No, no, it's not wrong or right. That's what I'm saying. It's not wrong. It's just looking back, I would have done it differently. So I hit, hit 64 and now, now, we, now we go back up. Get up to 64, the doors open, right? The people that I see are Pat Hoey, uh, who was my boss at the time, who was just an amazing person. I went right up to him, he was in the corner office. I said, Pat, I said, well, well, you know what happened? He goes, Pasquale, I don't know. He goes, but I was, I was like thrown out of my chair. He goes, I'm just calling to see, you know, what's going on. Then I saw Steve Fiorelli, Lisa Trefatola, who sat next to me on the other cubicle. Now no one's leaving, so the floor is empty except for 15 people that were there that I just walked in that didn't leave. Now, I know you're gonna ask, why didn't they leave? I have no idea. I found out later that there were calls and it was actually, it was actually published in the newspaper. Um, they were told to stay until the, so they would not block, you know, so the idea was maybe lessons learned in 93, the plane hit above us, the fire's above us. The firemen have to get to that, right? The staircases get clogged with people, right? And when they're evacuating, at least on the lower floors, the firemen can't get up now, right? They're not blocking the stairs. So in an efficient manner, you want to get the firemen as quickly as possible to that floor to fight the fire, right? So if you fill the staircases, now you're, blo you're blocking that. And depending on how crazy it is going down there, no one can go up. And at the time, the first towers hit. At the time, Tower One was hit, Tower correct? One. The one that I was in. Yeah, the North Tower. Who said stay? Someone said stay on the phone to Pat yeah, that's Hoey what I'm talking about. from the security desk. From downstairs. the security desk. Yeah. yeah. Now, in times of emergency, I'm no longer listening to the security desk. No, no, absolutely right. Yeah. Fine. Now, when things happen, I just run right out. I don't care yeah. what it is. So now everything's, it's like here, right? Everything's lit. Things are nice. There's no issues. Um, you know, at least that, on that floor. So I pick up the phone and I call my wife. And then we were picking up the phone and he, he was on the other end and he said, um, Louise, don't be alarmed, but can you turn the television on? You know, and I jumped up right away and I thought, oh, okay, sure. Like what's, what's going on, you know? And he said, I don't know. He said, but something happened to my building, but can you turn the television on and um, let me know if you see anything? So I said, okay, so I got up turned the TV on, and the first thing I saw was the World Trade Center, the tower with the antenna on top, it was on fire. And I said, oh my God, it looks like the top of your building is on fire. And as I'm listening and, and kind of like watching and kind of taking it in, I said, they're seeing a plane hit the building. And I said, uh, okay, I guess that's what it is. I don't even know. I said, okay. I said, well, I said, do me a favor. I said, can you please tell me, just on the building, just say low, middle or high? I said, did it hit in the middle of the building? Did it hit high in the building? I hit it low in the building. Because now I'm in a thinking process, right? And I'm thinking, I can hear. I'm thinking, if it hits low, I'm screwed, right? I gotta get past a fire below, right? 44th floor where I was, if it hit there, I'm screwed. If it hit middle, I still don't know because I'm on the 64th floor, right? It's about half, halfway up. And she said, no, it hit pretty high. I said, where are you? Are you, you know, are you, are you in the building? You know, and he said, yeah. And I said, what are you doing in the building? You have to get out. There's a plane, a plane hit the building. He said, no, no, don't worry. We're fine. We're going to, we're going to figure out what to do. I'm here with other coworkers. He goes, I'm okay. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll call you back. I said, Pascal, please just, you know, just get out, you know, just, just go. Now you go into that mode where you're like, okay, if you exit the building and then part of the building's burning on top and the pieces of it fall, you're going to get hit with it. The top quarter of the building collapses, yeah, it's going to come down on that floor, but then also topple wherever. I didn't know what 
which way to turn, what to do, go upstairs, go downstairs, go outside, call someone, you know, and I remember like his, his shirt from work, I think the day before that he had like left somewhere, maybe at the, I don't know, on the bedpost or on a chair or something. And I remember like I grabbed his shirt and I like, I put it on me because I wanted to feel him, you know, with me. And we have a cross on, on the wall upstairs and I just said, God, Jesus, please just, you know, just be with him right now. And I remember I had grabbed the crucifix and, um, and just had kept it with me like the whole, the whole day just praying and, you know, hoping that he would, you know, be home or call or just get out of there or whatever, so. You got firemen now going up to the scene, right? Think about that. Like, they're, they're as much as we say, like, why didn't we leave? Like, the, you could look back and say, well, why did they go up, right? But they're going up. So you think, okay, the fastest way to get the people that need their help is stay out of their way. So now the firemen are going up the stairs. When they get to our floor and say, hey, all clear, you guys head down. We would do that. So you have no idea right, right oh, now? Oh, there's another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> right? Oh, oh, my God. Oh. Another plane has just hit. Now, the second plane hit, right? We didn't see that, right? Actually, there was a conference room in the middle core. There was one of the rooms there. And it was coming a little bit grainy. I actually saw it replayed on that where it hit the other building. And so I thought, well, that's two really bad things that happened, right? The first plane hit his building. Then there was a second plane that hit the second building. And then I remember also not much longer after that, that the building that wasn't the one with the antenna that he was in came down. And I thought, oh my God, I can't believe this is, like it was just one horrific event after another that was so unfathomable that it was a nightmare. It was just a real nightmare. Um, and I remember thinking, all right, well, maybe that's got to be the last thing bad to happen because, you know, I always hear things happen in threes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the phone kept ringing, people kept calling, and they were very tentative because they knew how pregnant I was, and they were like, oh, have you heard from Pasqual? Did he go to work today? And I'm like, listen, I, I know what's going on. Yes, he called. He's okay, you know as far as I know right now. Some people didn't want to leave. And wow. it wasn't until, and the decision was made to leave when Pat Hoey and I, we constantly were walking around the floor, like making assessments. We finally saw some smoke coming in. So as soon as that happened, we were like, let's get out of here. We gathered up where we had flashlights in case we encountered anything going down. People got some waters and stuff. And then we, we lined up single file. Uh, made the phone call, left that one open, and then proceeded out to the to the hallway to stay, stairway B. When we decided with the floor with the smoke, Steve Ferrelli and I, who was one of the project managers at the time, he and I went out into the hallway, opened up the door, and the stairway was clear. There was like no smoke in the stairs. Okay. Uh, it was well lit. There was no one in it. So we reported back to everyone to say, listen, the stairways are clear. There's no one going up or down right now. Um, there's no smoke, you know, we should, we should get out of here, you know, and we, we, he and I even said to us, you know, what the hell are we still doing here? Now, I had called my wife a second time. And he said, you know, we're still here, and I just, I was so angry. I was like, why? Why are you still there? Like, why, you know? And it just went into this whole thing, and he said, no, no, we're leaving, we're going to be leaving, it's okay, we're fine, it's very calm here, we're going to make our way down. So I said, okay, Pasquale, please, just call me when you get out of the building, when you're, you're far away and you're, you're able to talk, or just let, let me know that you're okay. And so that was the last I heard from him. But Pat was probably towards the middle of the pack. Uh, Steve, you know, Franco. Right behind me was Janelle, Guzman, and Rosa. So now we start making our way down the stairs. And we're, we're going down at a pretty good pace, but we felt a rumbling on our floor. And we attribute it to like, again, some kind of structure. It was then also that we decided we just gotta get out there. Maybe the building's not, not stable at this yeah. point. So now we're making our way single file down the stairs, you know, not running down, not, not walking slow, we're just, you know, as quickly as you can go downstairs. This is clock management now. Yeah, this is probably maybe 10, 10, 15 minutes or so, something like that, 10 minutes. Got it. Um, so now we get into the stairs and we're going down. Uh, and it, it was it was fine until we got into like the um, the 40s, and then we we encountered um, some firemen, 
with all their gear on. I'd say it was probably six of them, six or seven. They were sitting on the stairs, and I'm, you know, so we were stepping like around them, you know, which like, you know, and they, because they were exhausted. I mean, you just, you just went up 40 flights of stairs with gear, right? Heavy gear. Yeah. And you're, now you're taking a breather. And one of the firemen said, which I thought was odd at the time, but um, he said, hey, listen, he goes, if you want to get out of here any quicker, there is an elevator working. Um, if you get off on the 23rd floor and you can take that down the rest of the way. I remember shouting out, I was like, I was like, hey, we could take an elevator on 23rd if you want. I was just throwing it out there. Everybody's like, no, no. You know, everybody yelled like, no. Right? So, so we just continue. But now we're still, we haven't reached 23 yet. And now we keep, continue going down the stairs, continue going down the stairs. And then I see 23, right? And I remember that was, that's what triggered it. I'm like, we could get off here, but we're not, right? Well, no one's getting into an elevator at that point again. So then again, we were all gonna go in or not. At this point, we formed this kind of like cohesive, yeah, yeah we're all together. Went down one more flight, got to 22. I was halfway down the stairs, and the way it works it was the, the, the landing, 22. You go down the stairs as a platform, you go down another set of stairs, and then another door to go to 21. So I'm here on just past 22, the door. Mm -hmm. I'm going halfway down the stairs, and then everything started to rumble. Tremendous pounding noise from above, like a freight train. Sound. Sound, sound. Vibration, sound, everything else. It was just, you know. At the time I had my briefcase, instead of like carrying it this way, and then over my shoulder this way, I just, I just took it and I put the strap, you know, around me across my, across my chest, and it was on my, on my back. So now I have this on my back, I'm heavy down the stairs, everything starts shaking, um, and just, inst you know, just instinctively, I, di I didn't even have time to think, really. I remember looking back kind of quickly with everything shaking and I saw Rosa and Janelle open the door because they were like screaming and then the other people were screaming. They opened the door to 22 and they tried to run onto the floor, right? Because now we're thinking something's falling through the stairs, something's rumbling down and stuff. I didn't have time to run up or run down and just instead I looked back and I, I dove from basically the middle of the, that, that, the stairs. I just like took a couple of steps and I jumped and I landed on that intermittent platform landing and I just put myself right into the corner and I curled up and tried to make myself as small as possible in the, in the corner there, thinking whatever's falling through, there was nothing to protect me other than the floor below me and the two walls that I can get into a corner on. So I just kind of curled up like this for whatever was happening. I had like nowhere to run at that point. And uh, the freight train sound, freight train was coming, the sound was, was just the collapsing, collapsing, pancaking every floor, pancaking from above when you saw it come down and then it peeled open like a banana. But everything, all the floors basically concentrated themselves and then one added to the another like a domino effect when it started to go and just built up, you know, heavy, heavy weight hitting the next floor. Now the next floor is not going to take the two that are above it. The next floor is going to take the three that are above it, the next one, and so on and so on. Now that thing starts to come down, and it's just imploding. When I was in the stairs, all I heard was the the just tremendous, you know, sound, the staircase, you know, shaking, um, and that's when I dove into the corner and just tried to protect myself. It, you know, at that point, I just had my eyes closed, and uh, I actually felt because I'm now up against the wall, and I felt the wall move, right, crack, and I felt the the, the floor kind of like start to give. And uh, it was just, now it's just like, just split seconds. I mean, you know, everything flashes through your mind. Uh, I'm like, my first, first thought was, I can't believe this is how I die, right? I can't believe this is, right? Just split seconds, I was like, oh my God, this, this, is how, this is my death. This is my death, this is how I die. Split seconds, I mean, like, I'm talking like milliseconds. From there, I'm like, I prayed for my, you know, I'm like, Please, you know, my wife, my daughter, I don't know, I'm never gonna see him. And then, you know, during the fall, it's like now I'm praying for, you know, quick death. So it's, oh my God, I'm gonna die. Please take care of my family. Make it a quick one, right? That's what I'm going through. And it's just because now I'm falling just an abrasive, uh, sandblasting type of effect. I'm on this. I guess slab, but it broke away. So now I'm kind of like free fall, getting knocked around, getting hit. I see flashes of light. 
uh, from getting hit in the head. You know, somebody even say you see stars, right? You know, you see stars, you get hit, right? You get a punch, or I was getting knocked around in the head, my back. I just stayed tucked in, the brace, and this is all happening quick, right? All those thoughts are going through my head. And then I see one big, boom, flash. Like, I knew that he didn't make it out. And uh, I think I was actually on the phone with his aunt. Um, so she's from Weehawken, and so she could, like, see everything, like, right across. And she was going to me, like, in broken Italian. No look, no watch, don't, don't look, don't look, don't, don't, don't look. Turn the TV off, turn the TV off. And I just, I just, like, dropped the phone, and I just, like, I went outside, and I, I don't know, I just kind of felt like, how could I be here? And there's this beautiful sky, right? And everything is peaceful and there's birds and the trees and, and I just watched, like I just watched Pasquale and all those people die. You know, and, 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 and then it was just me and Hope, like that was it. At that moment, it was gonna be just her and I. And I think the worst part of all of it was his parents, um, you know, they, they worked down in like Jersey City and I couldn't get in touch with her. His mother, my mother-in-law, um, she worked in a coat factory. At some point she must have saw on TV or whatever. My father-in-law worked construction out in the field so we don't know how to get in contact with him. And I remember, you know, she called me and I, I did not have the heart to tell her what I knew. Joe, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I told I'm you sorry. earlier that you were going to do this. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. So you don't have the strength to tell your mother-in-law what's happening. No. Okay. No. So, so she, and I now, and then she's like, oh my God, oh my God, the towers. I, I looked, there's the smoke. It's all smoke. It's all because she could see from where she was, yeah. the, the buildings are gone. And so she said, did Pasquale, did he go into work today? I said, yes. I said, but he called. He's, he's gonna, he's okay. I spoke to him. He's okay. You know, just come up, come to the house. Let's just, just be together. We, you know, we, we need you. Come up. They walked in the house and I mean, she just like, she just fell to the floor and she like, she grabbed my stomach and she just said, this baby has to have a father. This baby has to have a father. My son, he's good, he's good. He's, this baby has to have a father. And I mean, I just couldn't, I couldn't offer her anything. I couldn't offer her anything. I couldn't offer her, it's gonna be okay. I couldn't. How could you? I just. And then I opened up my eyes. It was about two and a half, three hours later. I was knocked unconscious. Either it was during the fall or when I actually finally landed, um, you know, riding the, the rubble, whatever was happening, I opened up my eyes and it was just blue sky, right? A field of rubble. I'm on this like little uh, ledge of, of broken concrete, looking down at an open pit, you know, and you hear like crackling like the fire there and stuff like that around. And everything looked beautiful and clear. And I was like, I thought it was gonna like, you know, you see those movies and you think you're gonna like rise up out of your body and then see yourself there like, you know, dead and now you're going somewhere else and you know, uh, um, you know, stuff like that. So you kind of like, feel like the Patrick Swayze movie, right? What is that, the ghost, ghost. right? Ghost, you know, you, split second. I mean, I'm not laughing, I, I wasn't thinking, of, but you know, like I was numb at that point. All I see is like, I knew what, I knew because it was just a flash and I opened up my eyes and I'm thinking, wow, that's, you know, I'm dead, right? I gotta be dead. So I'm gonna float up out of my body and uh, see myself. Wow, I have a headache. <laughs> I'm here. I'm, I'm dead with a headache. Right? <laughs> right? So, and then, and then I'm like, I started to feel pain in my, my foot and my leg, and I started coughing, and I was drenched. In debris. And I just sat back, I was like, I'm alive. I can't believe, I, I can't believe I'm alive. Like, I couldn't, you know, I was like, I'm like looking around, I was, you know, 
first I, I couldn't believe it myself that I, I survived. And I'm, look, I'm looking around at, at you know everything going on now. It started to get dark again because it would, it would clear sometimes, and then then you would get the smoke coming in, and then start to you know uh, cloudy up and stuff. And um, I started calling out for you know for other people. I'm like you know, hello, you know, hello, Pat, you know, uh, you know, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like. What, in what position? Completely. The same way I'm sitting here. I had, I had, the same way I'm sitting here. I had, it was on, I was on, con like concrete. There was a, a giant pipe. Uh, it was a stand pipe. It was for the uh, fire, fire suppression in the building. Mm -hmm. There was a, there was a, a pipe here, which, I mean, I have a theory on that, but there was all sorts of like conduit, broken conduit, rubble, and then it was just concrete behind me, like a, like a, like a mountain. It was like picture me like on on, the, on like on a mountain of rubble, on the edge of one of the pieces of of rubble on the on the end of that, and then and you could there was a down. Beam, there was a beam, and then a whole field, and then just an open pit that you could and see then, that I could see down into. So there was no way I couldn't. I'm, I'm like, even at that moment, I'm like, you know, I didn't want to fall into that, or you know. So I'm just, but I had no way to go, and then I, I knew my foot was broken. Because um, I felt it was like, you know, felt like it was swelling and stuff. And uh, and I was just sitting there, I was just kind of calling out for help. Just waiting and just astonished myself. I was like, I, you know. So I was knocked unconscious, like I said, probably, you know, looking back now, maybe two, three hours or so, something like that. And then I started to, you know, kept calling out every once in a while. Um, and then... I saw someone, he was about maybe 75, 80 yards away um, on a, uh, like a bullhorn, right? And I said, hey, hey, you know, hey, help me, I'm over here. And he looked at me, he goes, yeah, he goes, oh. uh, you know, people are coming, people are coming. So one of the firemen, I finally see one guy, he's searching the rubble and I, and I see him moving. So, so I yell out to him and uh, there's four that saved me that day. I, I yell out to him, I go, hey, you know, help him up here. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, he goes, yeah, what do you need? And I was like, uh, what do I need? I said, I don't know, I, I can't get down. He goes, you need a rope or something? What, 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 what? He thought I was another fireman searching the rubble. Because I was just sitting there, right? So I'm like- Oh, you thought you were being lazy. <laughs> yeah, right. I was like, I am just got stuck climbing this yeah. thing, looking for people, right? I said, no, I, just, I, I can't get down. I, I don't know, I'm just, who are you? Who are you? I said, I, I was in the building, I don't know. I was, collapsed I'm here I don't know he goes holy shit he goes we got a fucking we got a civilian up there we got it and he got on the radio you know and he goes all right hang tight we'll, we'll get to you we'll get to you hold, hold on you know the phone started ringing and then it wasn't Pasquale and people that knew that he worked down there were calling and wanting to find out you know um and then I had spoken with him again you would pick up the phone and you put it down and say, I haven't heard anything, I'm sorry, I'll let you know. And you put the phone down and constantly it would ring again, it would ring again, it would ring it. So I said, I just can't, I said, just somebody answer the phone. Don't be long, just if, if it's Pasquale, I don't, I don't want to talk to him, I don't want to talk to anybody. So now three other firemen join him and uh, I can see they're looking at me, you know, and he's, one guy has the, you know, the, the, the ropes and all that stuff, he was like the, um, uh, he was like the, the specialist, uh, the rigor type person that we call, you know. Um, so he's he's looking at me and uh, he's like, all right, we'll, we'll get to you. And then I see him, you know, he's small in stature, but, you know, solid. And uh, he starts starts climbing the rubble, you know, and I see him. So now I'm on this like little mountain there down there and there's an open pit and the, the, the beam. And then he starts he starts climbing, and I see him and then he disappears and I don't see him. You know, and I, I remember just, they were talking and stuff. And, saying stuff and they're looking and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling behind me and it was like maybe like a little bit of space not much but you know a little bit and he just kind of wiggled his way down right behind me he's like all right he goes uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to get you down let me let me let me you know let's see what we have and he started like tugging on stuff and shaking on things and you know I had that the, the pipes here and then so he takes he takes the rope and he he makes this cradle out of it right a rope cradle and he goes, all right, he goes, if, if you can, he goes, here, take this and, you know, swing it under you. I so I put it, you know, under my, my legs here. And then the other one kind of, you know, the other, the other loop was under here. And he's got the rope and he made a couple of loops around this piece of uh, pipe or steel. 
And uh, he's like, all right, what I need you to do is just kind of, you know, get to the edge and just kind of put, push yourself off, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> you, you push so, me off. push yourself. <laughs> I had to get buddy. down from there, right? So I'm looking at him like, he's a small guy. I mean, he's solid, but, and so I didn't want to embarrass him. You know, I, even then I was like, you know, I'm not, the guy's here to save my life. I'm like, you know, you're going to be able to hold me? You know, so I was like, I don't know, is that rope strong enough? And that, that yeah. pipe he goes, yeah, he goes, that rope's rated for 600 pounds. Don't worry about it. You know, we're good or whatever it was or 12, you know. He goes, he goes, yeah, just, he goes, I got you. He goes, just, I said, okay. And I just, I grabbed the rope like this and I just kind of, you know, rolled myself off. And I fell maybe a couple of feet or so, three, four, five, you know, whatever. And then boom, you know, and I started swinging a little bit. Okay. And he started to lower me down to the other guys. And now, you know, I'm in this like rope cradle and I'm just like kind of spinning around a little bit. And one of the firemen, I think it was, it was Mike Lyons, beautiful man, but, um, um, so he, he grabbed my foot and, uh, and that's when I knew I was like, holy shit, my, my, arm, I think my leg's broken, you know, my foot, because I felt this like sharp pain. And, uh, they pulled me over to the, to the beam and, uh, he goes, can you stand? You know, as they were lowering me, he was like pulling me over so I didn't fall into the pit and then, you know, landed on the beam. So, you know, I got there, then the other fireman got, got in front of me, behind me, and he goes, can you stand up? I said, yeah, let me try to stand up. So I put pressure on my, you know, I stood up on my foot. I was like, ah. Oh. He goes, he goes, we got some climbing to do. He goes, you're gonna be able to, to get out of here. Um, so I said, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll try. So we started to make our way and uh, pretty much climbing over this rubble to get out to the West Side Highway. And, uh, and now they're behind me, you know, make sure I don't fall. They still have like, kind of like a rope around me. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, the pain was kind of getting to me at this point because it, it ended up being a fracture of my, my, my cuboid and my, my foot. Um, and, uh, you know, I was trying to get out of there and I'm climbing. And then all of a sudden I felt a little, you know, like I was going to pass out. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I, hey, can you do me a favor? I said, just let me sit for a minute. I said, you know, they said, yeah, all right, all right. So I sat down and they must have looked at me and assessed me. They're like, he goes, yeah, you're kind of pale. He goes, all right, relax. He goes, we got it from here. So I was like, all right. Um, so then um, they got this plastic gurney and uh, they brought it out, strapped me in, and uh, they started passing me from one guy to another. So now they're dragging me across the rubble, you know, and uh, they're dragging me across the rubble, one guy to the next. Uh, and I'm there, and all of a sudden, this, <laughs> this piece of wood, one, I guess one of the firemen or pipe, or I think it was a pipe, he, uh, he steps on the pipe and kicks right up and boom, hits me right between the eyes, right? I had no blemishes on my face, nothing I'm that beautiful or anything, but I had nothing, right? No marks, boom, right between the eyes. And uh, he's, like, oh. he's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you all right? I said, yeah. I said, I'm fine. I said, Man, yeah. I said, I don't care what you hit me with. I said, just, you know, get me out of here. I have a wife at home, I gotta I got get out of here. So he's dragging me from, he goes, man, he goes, you're a heavy fuck, you know? And he's, I was like, yeah, I said, I said, I'm sorry. So I was going to join Weight Watchers today, as a matter of fact, with my friend, <laughs> my friend Nico, you know. I said, but he goes, yeah, no. Pull on the next guy. And then he finally get me out to the ambulance. Now the guy's there and he's trying to assess me and stuff. I was like, I said, listen, I said, I'm fine. I said, yeah, I, I need a phone. I have to call my wife. I need a phone. Can somebody please give me a phone? Um, oh, yeah, because you so lost your phone. I lost that. That got ripped off of me. Um, the the briefcase I had on my back that was that was gone that was ripped off of me. Um, so I get into the ambulance and one of the one of the paramedics he goes all right he goes I got a phone it's still working I think he had one of the services that wasn't knocked down because of the antennas there was different ones but most of them were on the World Trade Center so everybody lost communication at the on the phones. This one happened to be working and uh, I, I, I called my house and my wife answered the phone and it was him <laughs> and it was him and he was like. Louise and I was like, a squirrel! And I just screamed so loud and everybody was like, a squirrel! And the whole house just like shook and everyone was crying and laughing and screaming and I was trying to understand him and he was like, I'm like, where are you? Where are you? Oh my God, it's the squirrel, you know? And he was like, I'm okay, you know? The, um, so, you know, I said, uh, you know, she goes, what, what are you doing? Where are you going? I said, oh, they're taking me to the hospital. I asked them, I said, I'm going to uh, Vincent's. St. Vincent's Hospital, you know, she's like, okay, okay, you know, call me, you know, call me from there, is everything okay, oh my God, oh my God, Squall, you're alive, I can't believe it, you know, and again, people in the background, my friend Mike Potenza, you know, 
good friend of mine gets on the phone and he was, he was like, where the hell are you? What the fuck happened? You know, what's going on? You know, and, and he, he tried to take it all down and like, you know, they arranged then, he's like, I don't know. I, I don't even know, Mike, I don't know. I was in the building, it fell, it came down. Um, is she okay? And you know, is Louise doing, you know, whatever. He was so concerned about, you know, us you. and our family and the baby and, you know, and, and, and all that, you know? So, um. What a guy. <laughs> Why are you happy right now? Because. Father is alive. <laughs> All right, here it is. And I was home at eight o'clock that night. Full house, people still here. Full house. Crowded. Mother, father, you know, relatives, everybody. Um, I remember a uh, friend, Mike. He's got the video camera. He's like, Louise. He goes, That's it. He goes, I want you outside. Let's go. You want to tell Hope what happened on this day and how her father came home and you know why are you happy right now and you know and I remember being there you know I had the big belly and I was just like your father's alive you know and and we'll, we'll we'll deal with everything else afterwards let's just let's see let's you know let's get him home and all the people on the driveway here and uh you know my father was there and you know gave him a big hug I was on crutches so oh um, and then you know my mother you okay you want something to eat so that was the first thing. He's <laughs> like, you're right, did you come out, come inside, you know? I'll um, take a sandwich, Mom. Yeah, yeah. So I came inside, I ate, um, you know, plowed myself on the couch. Everybody was here, you know, just you know, telling a story. And then, you know, it was, it was great seeing them. And I just, at that time, I just wanted to process shit, you know, just take it all in. So uh, it wasn't until then that I actually saw the building and how it collapsed. And initially I thought, you know, maybe half of Manhattan was taken out at the time when I was, was sitting there in the rubble. I thought maybe part of the building just collapsed and toppled away from me, and that's why I survived. But when I actually saw it fall straight down, and I was in that concentration of forces and that, that, that whatever happened in the middle, it's more miraculous to me that I, I, I was able to survive. This was actually put together from the uh, Memorial Museum, World Trade Center Memorial really? Museum. Really? Yeah. The reason why I got it back is because, well, what's in here is the box is interesting, but what's in it is the briefcase that was on my back uh, when I fell, you know, with, with in the tower. But when I woke up in that rubble, the briefcase was anywhere to be found. It wasn't there. I would carry this with me on the train. I had a, a Walkman in there, you know, listen to music. Remember the Walkmans, right? Yeah. Had a Walkman in there and bills. Uh, that I would pay like at work, you know, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I'd have a stack of bills and so that had my address on it, name, all that stuff, you know, PCG bills, whatever. So that's how they tracked that down. But so um, life or death and you grab the bag with the bills in it and you yeah, get out of there. Yeah, you gotta pay this debt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then my life was in there, you know, information, right, uh, you know. So uh, it was my personal stuff. It was strange. I mean, even now, like, you, you, it'll hit me because the smell it's that musty smell. So you can still, you can still smell it. I smell it. Oh, I wish I didn't have sinus smell. problem. Um, it seems gone. You smell that musty smell? Oh my God, yeah. Right? It basically hasn't been, it was always in my garage. <laughs> on the shelf. Uh, but you could see, so as that fell with me, you can see the strap was ripped and torn off. And there's, see, there's no longer that big strap. Yeah. It was ripped off the, off of here, the, see the hook is gone? So yeah. it actually took the hook off of here and the hook is on there. And then you could see kind of like the, so this probably protected, you can see kind of like the lines and gashes in it. This probably took a lot of the hits as I was going down until it actually got ripped off my back. Got it. And it ended up somewhere in the rubble somewhere else. I see the duress. And they found it. How many times have you opened this bag since then? I've never opened it. It is the first time out of the box. My wife actually didn't even want it in the house. Really? No, because she said, oh, I don't know, you know, what could be on it, the snow, and this and that, so. So the Walkman could still be in there. I don't know. That would be something we're still in here, but this is incredible. Yep, there is an umbrella in there, and. Oh, you open it. Umbrella head at the time. Look at that. Because I had hair back then, so I didn't want to get wet. <laughs> Hold on. Hey! Wow! 
intact. Look at that. Louise, I found the Walkman. Look how we were living before the iPod I actually thought, I took, I actually thought I took it out. The headphones are still in. That's crazy. You might have a tape in there. Yeah, that's what I don't know. Nope, no tape. All right, no tape. That was a radio day. I spoke to my friend Nico. He was, you know, here when I got here, I said, I said, Nico, I said, I don't, I don't know if anyone else survived that. I said, I, I can't imagine, you know? And uh, I said, I hope they did. I said, have you heard anything? You know, he says, no, I haven't heard anything. So you never saw Pat again? No. Pat, Steve, Franco, Susan. There has to be an immense level of gratitude. Like, I even felt gratitude walking into your home. Like, you just can feel it. On the other side of that, there would have to be a really crazy survivor's guilt happening. A lot of people died, you know, that day. You know, civilians, firemen, police, you know, people's, you know, brothers, sisters, sons, mothers, fathers. Since that day for you, is it more gratitude or guilt? Uh, I went through stages. It was, you know, um, so sitting here on that couch day after day, I, 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 I mean, I went through, I went through the motions. I was kind of like, best way to describe it is, um, you know, because now my wife's pregnant. How do you even at that point feel okay to bring a child into a world now that is so turned upside down, you know? So I don't think that he could really make any sense of any of it. Um, was there like a relearning? process to your husband like okay let me learn who my partner is now after this yeah i mean in some ways yes i can remember a lot of it um especially like the beginning after that and the months that followed um and a lot of it like i tried to understand but I wasn't him, so I couldn't really understand it, you know. And 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 everybody would say to him, you know, Pasquale, you're you're you know, you're the luckiest guy in the world, you know. You're you're like look what you're look what you look what you've got. He would feel this horrendous amount of guilt, you know, for a lot of people that weren't as fortunate. I know when Hope was born. I remember him saying, well, thank God this takes a little bit of the focus off of me right now. Like, you know, we're all, we're focused on her right now. There's this, this new baby that we are going to give so much love to and, you know, just really make her our new world now, you know. But there were a lot of times where I think like he wanted to be more in that world, but like he couldn't. You know, there was a news articles of, of women that were, you know, pregnant at the time and, you know, the the babies would never see their fathers or, you know, significant other or whatever, you know, so I don't, to me that was so hard to, like, why did I survive, right? Why did I survive and they didn't? And then you, uh, I was in this I almost want to call it a fog in my head. So I, I, I went, I tried to go back to work as quick as possible on crutches. I tried to get myself into a normal routine, but I was basically a shell. Like I was just going through the motions because I felt that I had to do it. You know, you fall off the horse, you get back on, you just do it. And then eventually it'll pass. And then you'll get into, you know, feeling life again and, and emotions. But that day never came in that sense. And I never believed in getting help or anything like that. So now here I am back at work and, you know. How soon after so, did you get back to work? Oh man, it was probably, I was still on crutches. I'd say maybe four weeks, three or four weeks. Got it. Um, so I went in, you know, and uh, I would go in like, uh, not every day on crutches, but I would go in there and it was, it was nice seeing the people at work. Now, again, they were at Journal Square now that relocated us um, there. And uh, I, was in, I was in the Journal Square building and. And now, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm starting to walk again. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm healing and we're starting to get into some, some projects, some jobs that we had going on. And, uh, and one person made a comment and he, you know, it was about somebody who died that day that was with me. 
And I guess it just slipped his mind that he wasn't long with us. Something about the job and, oh, he didn't do this. And, you know, he should have done this. And, uh, and it was okay. I mean, it wasn't anything bad. But to me, it's like, how, how dare you? No matter what, they, I, you wouldn't even, shouldn't even mention his name and, and desecrate in any way negative about what he did in his work here. And I just, I remember I got up, I tried to stay calm, and uh, I walked down into the hallway, and uh, I just, like, you know, I kind of normally, normally do sometimes, just kind of get stuff out. I just, I just punched the wall a few times. I made a hole in the sheetrock, and I'm like, so holy shit, I'm at work here. What the hell am I doing? I can't, what's wrong with me, you know? I was so upset, you know, that anybody would dare say something about him and I felt guilt already about surviving and then here I am talking, you know, not me talking about it, even somebody else talking about it. So, uh, to his credit, John dropped me. I went right into him, I said, John, I said, I'm in a little trouble here. He's like, I, I don't know why you came back. He goes, you know, like, you know, I said, yeah, I should have just, uh, you know. I'm he with goes, him. He goes, he goes, go home, take all the time you need. He goes, I have some, you know, I have someone you could talk to if you want. I said. Okay, I said my wife, and 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 then I started seeing someone, um, and uh, you know just talk about it, and I wasn't getting over it. We were having this supposedly joyous moment as a couple, you know, bringing in a new a new baby, and that you planned years for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There were things that he would just say, I just, I, I can't do this right now with you guys. Like, you know, go take her for a walk or go do something you and Hope together. Or, you know, I just, I, I need some time right now. Who knows what could have triggered it that day. How was that for you? Well, I mean. Heavy, heavy load. You know, it was, it was a little frustrating. I'd say, but Pascual, like, you know, you, you're alive, you know. Like, we need you, this, this baby, she needs you. You know, we, we need to do this now. We need to be our family. We need to be who we were before and, and try and, you know, go along our, our path, you know? I wanted to be here for my wife, you know, and, and my daughter, Hope, who was, you know, now, now she's, she's born, you know, it's, you know, a few months later. Um, I kind of came to the realization and that, you know, I don't know if this helps others or somebody, but this is how I kind of, you know, I said to myself, well, okay, there's, yes, the survivor guilt now. And I always try to put myself in another person's shoes, right? No matter what it is, whatever their opinion is on something, whatever, however they, you know, because, you know, we've all walked different paths, right? We've all come up differently. So now I put myself in Pat Hoey, who was, a, a, was an amazing father, a family man, everybody, you know, it's not just me saying that. Everybody said that at work. He was, you know, you work hard, you play hard. He was, you know perfect human being in that sense and uh and i said to him you know i said to myself if it was reversed and i was there and now say there is a heaven and i'm up there and i'm looking and i'm gonna say the fuck's the matter with you right you just you survived right if you're not gonna live your life take care of your family then you know what the fuck did i die for like why don't we you know yeah. <laughs> Why don't we switch now? It would so in that sense, I took it as it would be a disservice or or something to the people that died if now I didn't try to live my life to the fullest and be there, you know, for my family and be like, it's okay that you you know you survived and, and they did because you want to honor them. A very special reunion today between firefighters and a man they pulled out of the World Trade Center. Thank you so much for being in my hospital on that day. Her husband is Pasquale Buzzelli, and had it not been for several New York City firefighters, Pasquale would not have lived to see the birth of his brand new baby. One of the firemen's good friends, girlfriend they dated back then, you know, in the 2000s, she was a Red Cross worker, and it was her mission to find the man that her boyfriend saved that day. Because the fire department was, the morale was awful. He was searching the rubble down there and uh, every day he would come home from searching the rubble and it was, it was hard. I mean, those guys, 
you know, everybody thinks, oh, you know, you search in Rome, they just, now it's passed, but everybody forgets they, they're there every day and they're either finding bodies um, or searching it and he would come home just totally exhausted, number one, physically, and then mentally just distrained. They lost so many, so many brothers, so many family members, all that, you know. So I get this phone call one day and she says, you know, I think I know, I know you don't know me, but I'm from the Red Cross. Mike Lyons was one of the firemen that rescued Pasquale and our stories matched. He was able to reunite with all the firemen that were there that rescued him. Mike Lyons, Mike Morbido, John Drury, and uh, Jimmy Keesling. Jimmy's the one that did the whole the rope. rope cradle. We got to meet them that day and, you know, we, we got to um, hope, got to meet the, the men that rescued her. So every September 11th, ever since then, Mike has invited us down to uh, the Harlem Zoo, which is what his fire department now is called. Um, and, uh, you know, it's up in Harlem. So we go, we brought the kids, and, you know, we've been like, you know, we've been like family. And so that's what we do on September 11th. It's just a beautiful ceremony and a mass. So this year is a little different. Um, Firefighters, family and friends said goodbye to FDNY Captain Michael Lyons. He was a beautiful person. He passed away from uh, lung cancer. <laughs> and he rescued me. He was a friend. Lung cancer from the smoke. Yeah. Just wanted to mention him. Mike, he's uh, he's passed on, and so he wasn't, um, you know, we wasn't there this year. Um, but um, we're going to be there this September 11th, God willing, and um, you know, we're going to continue that tradition as long as we can because on that day, especially, like, it's a sacred day. Captain Lyons' heroism on September 11th was exceptional. My final question for you, what have been some of the other just, like, big moments in your life since that day that you cherish and you celebrate, but you wouldn't have experienced? You know, it's not just one, it's just, oh. it's all. I don't have like a big peak. It's, you know, it's anniversaries, it's achievements that they do. And I don't show it, you know, my, my wife always complains, like, oh, wait, wait, look what happened, which is, you know, I am proud. I just don't show it, you know, sometimes. But, um, you know, it's amazing to see my kids grow. It's a blessing. Yeah. I'm very blessed that way, you know. Uh, where I love my job, uh, love my life, so. It's 21 years later now, right? But it comes in waves. I think that as sad as that is, it's also like a, a thing that you need to keep in your being to keep us all grounded because, Joe, if I could say anything good that came out of that day, our country came together like never before. We saw the best in people, we saw the worst in people, but we also saw how we all suffered and we all needed each other, you know, and we still, we all need each other. I always tell my kids, I mean, you know, and I'm very proud of them. They're amazing, you know, artists. And if that hadn't happened, first of all, I wouldn't have been here to see that. My second daughter, my youngest daughter, Mia, she, she wouldn't have even been born. You know, just watching them grow up and, and it's, it's awesome, you know. As if your story could get any more miraculous, your oldest daughter's name is Hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And y'all had that name for her before. Before any of this. Right. Yeah. Well, Pascal, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for opening your home. Thank you for taking the time out. Yeah. Thank you for crying with me. You know, I try not to cry, but it's, you know, it's, you know, I'm still, you know, I guess maybe that man, Italian thing, whatever you want to call it. But uh, tell your parents the first that time crying is a part of our structural support. Yeah. Yeah. It is. 
Thank you, Joe. Thank you, man. You're incredible. <laughs>